Hello and welcome to the Clinical Liver Disease video series. CLD is an official digital learning publication of the AASLD. I'm Kin To, Assistant Professor of Digestive Disease at Yale University and an Associate Editor of the Social Media section with CLD. I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Caldwell and Dr. Lauren Carlini from the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the University of Virginia to discuss their article, Coagulation Homeostasis in Liver Disease. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So what, what is the current understanding of the homeostatic pathway uh, changes that occur in cirrhosis? Yeah, so traditionally the teaching regarding coagulopathy and cirrhosis uh, has focused really on the increased risk of bleeding. However, in, in recent years, we've come to understand cirrhosis uh, as a state of rebalanced homeostasis uh, due to complex changes and factors that affect the body's ability to both form and break down clots. Uh, that balance, though, is considered to be tenuous and can be tipped uh, easily by factors such as the presence of infection, volume overload, uh, or kidney dysfunction. Um, can you discuss the, the controversies around and, um, and the areas of needed research for around anticoagulation and cirrhosis? Yeah, we address um, several of these in the, in the paper, um, in particular, um, the treatment of portal vein thrombosis, or PVT. Um, up to one quarter of cirrhosis patients um, without uh, cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, have been shown to develop uh, portal vein thrombosis uh, during their course. Whether PVT is merely a reflection of the severity of the underlying liver disease or if it in fact contributes to decompensation um, is an area of debate. Um, in fact, some studies examining the natural history of PVT report that 30 to 70 percent um, spontaneously uh, resolve. However, it's been shown in multiple studies um, that PVT at the time of liver transplant actually impacts outcomes uh, including complications and mortality rates. So current guidelines and consensus statements uh, recommend consideration of treatment for chronic PVT in transplant candidates after screening and prophylactic treatment of varices. Um, in this paper, we review several recent studies that have shown overall low bleeding risk in patients treated with anticoagulation, um, though many of the studies are limited uh, by their uh, retrospective design. It's also unclear, unclear whether one anticoagulation medication um, is superior to others. At this time, we recommend considering anticoagulation, either uh, low, molecular weight, low molecular weight heparin or uh, warfarin for potential transplant candidates with cirrhosis and PBT after the appropriate varicell screening and prophylaxis. Um, and then there's also the matter of the safety and efficacy of uh, direct oral anticoagulants uh, or DOACs in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. Um, the studies that initially looked at the efficacy um, and uh, safety of DOACs um, did not study this particularly in uh, cirrhosis patients. So it's really unknown um, whether these medications are efficacious or safe for these patients. We review recent studies, particularly those comparing DOACs uh, and warfarin in the, um, in the prophylactic use uh, in atrial fibrillation. And though those studies have been generally small and retrospective, uh, DOACs in cirrhosis patients have not been shown to be significantly different than warfarin in regards to efficacy and bleeding risk. However, relatively few patients with decompensated cirrhosis, again, were included in these studies, so no real guidance can be given at this time. Um, regarding uh, those medications in, in, the, in use in these patients. Um, and then finally, there's one particular area um, that has come up in recent years, and that's the prophylactic use of anticoagulation um, to prevent the development of portal venous throm thrombosis. Um, there have been relatively few studies in this area. One, though, uh, a few years ago by Via et al., uh, analyze the safety and efficacy of the use of uh, low molecular weight heparin for the prevention of PVT in cirrhotic patients. The patients received um, the medication daily uh, for 48 weeks and compared to 16.6% .6 of patients in the control arm that didn't receive anticoagulation, uh, actually none of the patients receiving low molecular weight heparin ended up developing portal vein thrombosis. And then the treatment group also had significantly fewer episodes of decompensation and higher rates of survival, as well as no significant increased risk of bleeding. 
Um, so this is an exciting result um, that's not really been replicated as yet, but certainly raises the possibility of a potential role for prophylactic anticoagulation in the management of cirrhosis. Yeah, I have to say it, it seems like before, you know, anticoagulation was not something that we commonly thought about, but nowadays it almost is brought up by multiple providers, including, you know, even people in the community as well, you know, whether or not anticoagulation is something that's worthwhile, not only from the treatment of thrombosis, but just in also from the hepatic decompensation standpoint. So it's very fascinating. Um, so what would you like readers to take away from reading this article at this point? Yeah, um, I think again, so the understanding of thrombosis and bleeding and cirrhosis, it's an evolving and important area in the field of hepatology. Um, and, and like you mentioned, traditionally cirrhotic patients were believed to be at high risk of ble bleeding and thus at low risk of thrombosis. But we've really uh, come to understand, especially over the past 15 to 20 years, that patients with cirrhosis are at risk of both bleeding and thrombosis. So there are a lot of important questions left to be answered, um, including, as I mentioned above, uh, when and how to treat PBT, whether DOAX can be safely used and decompensated cirrhosis, and whether there truly is a role um, for prophylactic anticoagulation um, to prevent uh, portal vein thrombosis and possibly decompensation. So I think those are all exciting areas. Yeah, I agree. I think this is a really exciting point uh, to actually think about nowadays in our patients. Um, anything else, so Dr. Caldwell, anything else you would like to include? I had a, I had a few, few points. Uh, Lauren covered everything pretty nicely. Um, but one thing I think you, we can view uh, cirrhosis as an acquired protein C deficiency. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're relatively hypercoagulable. Most of the bleeding is pressure driven and not really dependent on the hemostatic mechanisms. Um, one, a couple other things. One is the INR really doesn't, um, isn't a good measure of uh, thrombotic potential. Uh, it probably is an indicator of stability. It may be a, a pretty good prognostic marker, but I think reacting, we shouldn't really react to the INR uh, the way we used to. And there was a study not long ago that uh, showed giving plasma actually um, uh, uh, dimin um, diminishes thrombin generation, uh, hmm. probably because you're replacing protein C uh, in that state. And then the final thing I would add is that um, when you run into diffuse mucosal or puncture wound bleeding, think of um, a condition called hyperfibrinolysis which can happen it's probably triggered by either infection or, or maybe related to ascites fluid getting into the bloodstream uh, through the thoracic duct, for example. Um, and, um, and in that situation, uh, it's characterized by um, diffuse bleeding, oozing under gauze and stuff like that. And it may respond to amicar or tranexamic acid. So you got to think of some different therapeutics uh, when, when you run into that. Yeah, actually we, uh, we've started to do that in our, in our patients here too, where they have the diffuse bleeding. We've thought about doing Amricar and actually been using a lot of the thromboelastography to kind of guide our, our um, yeah. management of the coagulation for those patients. Well, thank you okay. again. Okay. Oh, ahead, can, it's kind of hard to interpret in these patients, but uh, yep. I think they can be helpful. Yes, for sure. Well, thank you again for joining us for another installment in clinical liver disease video series. Uh, and thank you for our readers for joining us. On behalf of all of us at the clinical liver disease team, I hope you found this interview as interesting as I have. Um, thank you, Dr. Caldwell and Dr. Carlini. Um, for more information about the coagulation, homostasis, and liver disease, please visit us at www.cldlearning.com. And also don't forget to follow us on Twitter at CLD Learning. Thank you again for watching. Thank you.